So let me just say a few words about the Art Circle and the celebration here today. Uh, I want to thank the members of the Art Circle Committee who have been working very hard to make this event the success it's turning out to be. They've been working over the course of many months. I want to thank Mary Baglevo, who uh, loves the market. You know, take a northwestern direction, loves the market, our great university. But I think there's some, nothing she'd rather market, actually, than the arts and the humanities, and it's a labor of love for her. Lisa Corrin's there. I can see you through there. Wave, Lisa. Yeah, I thought that was you right there. Uh, incredible, incredible visionary director of the block, and I've had the great joy to work with her at two different places, and bringing her here to Northwestern was certainly one of the smartest things I ever did, along with our brilliant provost who's sitting up there as well, uh, Dan Linzer, our chief academic officer. So you're going to see a pack, you're going to show your video in a couple minutes, and you're going to have a great panel. Why art? Uh, let me just say a few words about that myself. And I really say it as not so much the president of Northwestern, but as a, an economist who does a lot of work on rates of return, the different kinds of accumulation of human capital. In other words, I, I'm the one when you read in the paper quite often it says this is what uh, somebody who studies engineering starts off and earns over a lifetime or somebody who studies law or medicine or business and on and on and on. And I can tell you as an economist, when you actually look at the rate of return, the financial rate of return, which is just one part of what we try to do at Northwestern, I'm going to get to the second part in a minute. But if you just look at the monetary return, and somebody asked me this, I did an event, Adrian Randolph, the Weinberg Dean was there. Before the panel we did in San Francisco uh, two nights ago, somebody said, you know, what's the future of the humanities and the arts with all this focus on STEM and all this focus on job creation and all the focus on the rate of growth of, uh, of GDP, et cetera. And I said, well, you asked the right person. You know, I'm an economist. This is what I work on. And it's true that if you study and you graduate with a degree in science, technology, engineering, math, economics, business, and on and on and on, you start off pretty well in the labor force. And now, on the other hand, if you start off in the performing arts or, or, or the humanities, you start out a little below, but if you go on there and you look at the what we call the slope of the age earning profile, the trajectory of earnings over your life, here's something that most people don't know. You know, after you go out 12, 15 years, people with the arts and the humanities degrees are on average not only making as much as people with STEM degrees, in many cases they make even more. Now why is that? Why is it? Because what's a better thing, what's a better way to learn about cultural difference. What's a better way to learn to be creative than studying the humanities and the arts? So yeah, there are a lot of schools who are justifiably proud of investments they make in business and in law and, and in medicine and engineering, and we are too at Northwestern. But this is an institution, this is a university that's never going to forget that the arts and the humanities are the most basic components of liberal learning. The other thing I want to say very quickly is that even if it weren't the case that people studying and professors and staff supporting the arts and the humanities, even if it weren't the case that you could easily justify their existence in terms of economic growth and prosperity, I would still say that the Northwesterns of the world have a moral obligation to invest in the arts and the humanities. I like to remind people that if they get it right in medicine and they get it right in science and engineering, you know what? We stay alive longer and we're healthier. They get it right in my field, economics and related fields and applied social sciences. You know what happens? We're wealthier, and if we really get it right, our societies are more just. But you always have to ask yourself the question, who wants to live long and who wants material well-being without all the joys and exhilarations and stimulation that comes from great literature, Great music, great art, great cinema, great dance, and on and on and on. I don't know, maybe some people would want to live in that world. I wouldn't want to live in that world. So as we celebrate the arts and the humanities today, be, be very clear that at Northwestern University, we celebrate those blessed, wonderful subjects, not just one day a year, but every single day of the year. Now, we have a little video I alluded to, and it, it shows some of the luminaries some of the people who've gone through Northwestern over the decades, who have made incredible contributions, worldwide contributions to the arts and the humanities. Let me tell you, if you're in the audience and you're really accomplished and you're not in the movie, blame Mary. No, don't blame anybody, because I've got to tell you, 
When you look at the list of alumni, and if you want to see some more, go over to the Siegel Visitor Center about 100 yards from here and look at the alums we celebrate who best represent Northwestern. So this is a movie of about four minutes. Trust me, we could have done Gone with the Wind parts one and two and still have other people be insulted. But I just want to say again, I'm proud to be at a university that appreciates the arts. I'm proud to be at a university that celebrates alumni from the arts. And I'm proud to be part of a very special day. Thank you. I'm Allison Cuddy. I'm the Associate Artistic Director at the Chicago Humanities Festival. And um, for the last at least three years, we have kicked off our fall festival, as we will this year, October 29th, here at Northwestern University. And we were very thrilled to be in the Beenan School of Music last year. We collaborate with Lisa Croen at the Block Museum and Wendy Walls at the Alice Kaplan Center for the Humanities and with the support of President Shapiro and Provost Linzer. So, it's wonderful to be back here um, talking about the arts. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Terrific. We're off to a good start. Um, so we've got 40 minutes. Uh, I would add to President Shapiro's list of why the arts matters that artists are among the most ambitious of people in the world. And we are very ambitious this afternoon because in about 40 minutes we're going to answer why the arts matter. Um, <laughs> I guess asking why the arts matter begs the question of who are we trying to convince? Um, and I think all of us are convinced of the importance of the arts. I mean, we're here, there are dancers on rooftops, there are men on stilts, and women on unicycles, and there's about to be a cello happening after this. So um, I think maybe the question is how the arts matter. And we've brought together a, an incredible panel of people to, to talk about that. And so I'll do quick introductions, and then we're going to dive right in and have a great conversation. So um, on, on the far side of the stage for me is Martha Tedeschi, who has been just an incredible, important figure in the city of Chicago as, um, at the Art Institute of Chicago, but sadly is leaving us in a mere two weeks to go to Harvard to be the director of arts museums at Harvard University. Victor Goines is just one of the most incredible jazz musicians, uh, not only in Chicago, but in the United States. Uh, he's here as the director, professor of and director of jazz uh, in the School of Music. He has been part of the jazz at Lincoln Center and the Wynton Marcellus Septet for more than 20 years, which is just an incredible accomplishment. Also a fantastic solo artist um, and composer uh, who did a great tribute to New Orleans the city of his birth, Crescent City, not that long ago, here right at Northwestern. And like the president, has very nice taste in ties. So, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I had the pleasure of interviewing Stuart Dybbuk when he was awarded a MacArthur um, Fellowship, aka the Genius Grant, but I think many of us knew long before that what a genius he was, an incredible writer. Um, the list of his books is long. I Sailed with Magellan, The Coast of Chicago, Childhood in Other Neighborhoods. He's also a poet, um, has two wonderful new anthologies of stories out, and has really put Pilsen Little Village on the map um, as a kind of imaginative creative space for thinking about why, how we are human. Stuart, welcome. And then Thomas Bradshaw is in the, I say, in this um, accusatory tone, but not. Um, one of the more provocative playwrights working in the United States right now uh, is in the um, MFA in writing for the screen and stage, um, but has put together an incredible uh, body of work, I said provocative already, um, ranging from the most recent Carlisle to plays, intimacy, fulfillment, so many wonderful productions, and it's a delight to be able to talk you, with you as well. So Thomas, I'm going to have you start, and our question put broadly is to think about how the arts matter in your life. I mean, what role do they play? What is the pleasure and purpose of the arts for you? Uh. That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess I would start off by saying that uh, I wouldn't be who I am today without the arts, but um, I guess my personal hero is, I was talking to Stuart about this earlier, is Bob Dylan. 
and he's kind of my model for um, the type of career that I would like to have, in the sense that uh, he always follows his artistic impulses, whether that's popular or not, and um, he doesn't allow himself to be blown around by the uh, by the wind in that regard. So I strive to do that. <laughs> Blown in the wind. Uh, so I strive to do that as an artist. And uh, I went to a school for the first seven years of my life, like kindergarten to sixth grade, I guess the school that uh, would be described as a school in the ghetto of Orange, New Jersey. And in seventh grade, I got a scholarship to go to this very prestigious art school in Short Hills, New Jersey. And we spent half the day doing art and half the day doing academics. And I played Macbeth in the seventh grade and Theseus in A Midsummer Night's Dream in the eighth grade. And it really changed the course of my life. Um, I shouldn't tell the story I'm about to tell, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> when I was graduating from college, I, I, I had decided I wanted to be a playwright in college. So I decided to get a degree in playwriting. but I, I thought that was kind of crazy, so I was double majoring in sociology, and at Bard, um, there's this like senior thesis you have to pass, and the sociology people didn't want to pass me <laughs> for my senior thesis, and the playwriting people were like, Thomas is a brilliant playwright, he's going to graduate school, you guys just have to pass him. And, uh, <laughs> uh, under the condition that I would rewrite my thesis over the summer. And I did, and um, I went to graduate school, and uh, you know, I got my rate, first rate review in the New York Times when I was 25 years old, right after I had gotten out of graduate school for a play that I had written in graduate school. So um, uh, art really is my life, I would say. Story. Well, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here because um, that integration of the arts is uh, central to one of the things I love about Northwestern. And um, it, it's easy when, you're, um, when your art is writing to talk about writing, but I'm actually more interested in the, the effect of the other arts on my personal life, on my professional life, and on my teaching. Um, the, really, the first art for me uh, that opened all the doors to everything else was music. I'd taken years and years of uh, music lessons and worked in the, it was this great jazz record store. And uh, to this day, I hardly ever sit down and write when I'm not writing the music. A lot of times I don't know what I'm going to write until I put a piece of music on. Uh, but it, uh, the effect that it's had lately is that um, Ellison mentioned one of my books is called I Sail with Magellan. That's actually the title of a song that my brother and I made up. And the reason that book has the title of the song is that that entire book for me is a total homage to music and its influence. Um, a, a book that came out a couple of years ago is called Paper Lantern. In that book, every story, the first story is called Tosca, obviously referring to opera. But every story in that book takes another art, whether it's visual art, uh, of literature, film, theater, um, what have you, and integrates it into the story. And each story in that book really is about the how art shapes our notion of life and how the counterpoint between how you actually live and how art can make you want to live. Um, that, that space in between interests me. So I, I, I'm gonna end with just the talk, going back to teaching. You would think that um, somebody talked about how important art was for them, and I came from, an, my father was a Polish immigrant, I came from a poor neighborhood. So it, it, when I say open the doors, I mean really open the doors, partly to being an American. But um, for years, when I, as I watched that, I saw a, a former student of mine on that, uh, and, and friends of mine on, on that wonderful video. But when
when you teach undergraduates, one of the things that constantly comes up in conversation is, my God, the talent, how, much, how wonderfully they can write, but they don't have life experience yet. And I, about five years ago, <laughs> after 25 years of teaching, it just became plain to me that that kind of defining experience in that Hemingway-esque way is ridiculous. That what we read, what we listen to, going all the way back to children, if you were lucky enough to have a parent reading to you, or all the comic books you read, the stuff that you went to the library and sought out on your own, all that is incredible experience. It's just as deep an experience as uh, all that Hemingway-esque stuff. And so in my writing classes uh, in the last five or six years here, I've tried to make that uh, a central aspect of the writing class. And the effects have been amazing. I mean, I, I now have, every quarter, I have undergraduates who publish their first story that comes out of the writing class. And um, so, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious to talk more about teaching mythology, so that's a good start. Um, Victor, for you, the, the purpose and pleasure of art in your life right now, what's going on? Well, art has allowed me to figure out who I am and how I fit into this puzzle of humanity. And it has allowed me to realize that we have more in common and we have different. We look around the room and we can see all our differences. But if we look really close and get to know the people around us, we find out that we actually have more in common. And through collaboration with like the New York State Theater, Twala Thorpe, New York Philharmonic, Sydney Orchestra, and Sydney Australia, not just the performances, but the opportunity to be able to interact with people both in concert but out of concert with visual artists as well and um, performing arts writers and, and things of that nature. It's been a constant education for me to become more familiar with myself. And um, coming from New Orleans, not being in, from a musical family, I hear so many people uh, when I'm on tour with Winton, it seems like everyone in the band always say, I'm from a musical family. So I have to tell kids who are not from musical families, you can actually be successful if you're not from a musical family. The arts are available to you as well. So you could be the first of your family. The arts has truly allowed me to get a view of what the world has to offer to all of us. So I would say, um, speaking personally, that art for me is usually my way in. Um, and I think of that in a lot of very specific ways. For example, I realized the other day that it is my practice when I go to a new country or a new city, um, particularly when traveling abroad, but also in this country, that the first thing I always do after checking into my hotel is go to the museum, whatever the major museum is in that city or that, that town. Um, and I think the reason I do that is partly because I'm in the museum field and I have a curiosity about museums and you know how we think about our practices uh, as museum curators and administrators. But more so, I think museums, which are so often situated right in the heart of their cities, I think cities have built themselves around their museums in many ways. Um, I find that that's a very grounded way to begin to encounter and to have a way into a new culture. Um, one can you know, see what the creative, creative history of a culture has been, but one can also see what that culture has collected and amassed, what that culture has valued over time. And I always feel like that is my best way in, um, and I begin to have a more sort of uh, cultural comfort level once I've been to one or two museums in a particular city. So that's a, one example of you know, how it's a way in. Um, art has also really been a way in. Um, practicing art has been a way in for me to my career. I started off in high school as a printmaker. And um, I really wasn't good enough, and I realized that pretty quickly. But I ended up becoming a print curator. 
And part of the reason was I always had the bug. I could feel, you know, at the tactile feeling of the paper and the way the ink sat on the paper. And I could explain, you know, in evocative terms how the print was made in a way that I couldn't have if I hadn't practiced it. So it also really very much has been art making at, you know, sort of junior level has been the way into a career path. Um, and then speaking outside of you know, the visual arts, um, I was also a dancer, a modern dancer in college and high school. And I wasn't good enough at that either. Um, but what I find today is still when I'm watching a dance performance, my legs twitch. You know, I, I'm actually experiencing that performance in a different way than I think I would have had I not been a dancer. So you know, for me, I would generalize. And a, a big topic like this, but to say that it's always for me a way in. The notion of place and how that is important to thinking about art, because we're all kind of in a certain place with a certain group of people. And if you could speak a little bit about that, um, maybe Tom, what you do? Uh, <clears throat> well, I, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question, but I'll, I'll talk about the play I just had at the Goodman for a minute in the sense that that play takes place on the evening that the audience is seeing it. Right. So I have, and, and it was about politics, so I had to rewrite it. This is the play Carla. Yeah, the play yeah. Carla. And I had to essentially rewrite it every night depending on what was happening, you know, in the news and politics that day because it had to take place in the night that the audience uh, was, uh, was was seeing it. And, um, and uh, I think art allows us to discuss things that can be very difficult to discuss in our own personal lives, uh, with our family members, uh, uh, you know, with our colleagues, with our friends, it creates a space for us to um, engage with these, uh, you know, uh, really very important issues. Um, when I was in college, I, I, I used to temp and uh, for, uh, for all the press for Carlisle, I refused to say whether I was a Democrat or Republican because I didn't want to sway what people thought about the show, but I am a liberal, and I used to hang out with this guy who, we became really good friends, and then one day, I found out that he was a Republican, and I pretty much couldn't speak to the guy anymore because I couldn't believe that he held the beliefs that he held, and, uh, you know, my my wife's family, you know, um, a lot of them are Republicans and they own guns, and we just have to not talk about politics so that you know we don't end up shooting each other, or that I don't end up getting shot when I go over to their houses. Um, but you know, the theater is a place where uh, we can, where I can dissect. The, the very important issues that are going on in our society and create a space where you know, Democrats, Republicans, everyone along this political spectrum can come together and, and air their feelings and hopefully um, be able to understand each other and come together in some way. I don't think I answered your question at all, but that's No, you opened up something very interesting. Um, and air their feelings, and those feelings are very ugly sometimes. I mean, that's Absolutely. It's not like a like a safe space necessarily that you're creating? Well, I think it is a safe space. I think it is a, because that's what the space is for. Whereas um, the family dinner table may not be the designated space for that. <laughs> you know, when, you know, uh, I mean, the, the theater is kind of a religious space. You know, we come to the theater, the lights go down, we reverently watch the, the actors on stage, we listen intently, and, uh, and we understand that it's meant to provoke discussion. Uh, my first play at the Goodman, Mary, after the first performance, they had so many people stay for the talk back, you know, it, 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 they had never had that many people stay for the, for the talk back. There were like 250 people that stayed for the talk back. So we started having a talk back every single night, and you know, between one and 200 people would stay, and people are talking about their childhoods with each other, about 
why they have the beliefs that they have, and um, people were able to open up in a way that they wouldn't be able to open up if they hadn't seen that play. So I think it is a safe space. Victor, does that, do you connect to what Thomas was saying? I'm thinking about Crescent City and like where, what music offers in thinking about a particular place and a place that has experienced this tremendous trauma you know, in recent years. As a jazz musician, the space is very important to us. Whether it's Galvin Hall with the beautiful view of the skyline of Chicago or the Village Vanguard, which is really just a basement in New York City. And I can remember as a kid for so many years looking at the recordings of, of John Coltrane live at the Village Vanguard, Bill Evans live at the Village Vanguard. And one of my main goals was to get into that space at the Village Vanguard. And I still remember the first person I saw at the Village Vanguard was a great tenor saxophonist, Joe Henderson. And the impact it had of the rhythm of the room and the people in the room, even to the point now when I play, it is a much more enjoyable experience for me when I can actually see my audience because they're as active a part of the performance as I am as the performer. With all the money spent on weapons, one of the great weapons that the United States has had forever has been the voice of America. And what Scrovecki's novel was about was under, na under the Nazi occupation and then under the Russian occupation, uh, Soviet occupation. What the voice of America, and especially the jazz that was being played on the voice of America, meant to all these people who un were listening. And so that, that notion of one culture creating a myth through their art, that then other cultures all over the, the world, a lot of times trying to put up walls, whether electronic or real, to keep them out. Um, that also, I think, figures you know, really powerfully in this whole notion of what art does, what, what, what a, the, the mythologizing that art makes, how we mythologize democracy. Right, and that power is really demonstrated. There's a, there's a story about Louis Armstrong was traveling. I think it was in Germany, and they were at war. And for one day, they stopped the war to hear Louis Armstrong. And that was the power of his art, to make people realize that there was a beauty that needed to be heard, regardless of all that was taking place in their world. Um, so just to go back to you know how one uses works of art to teach, I think um, there's nothing like taking a single art object and getting students involved in the idea that there are multiple different ways in or viewpoints that are equally valid in talking about a single work of art. Um, so in some ways it's just the perfect, um, it's the perfect place for um, bringing in the interdisciplinary approach um, to be able to look at an object as an object of trade, as an object of the economy, as an object of its materials, and an object um, that has had a history, sometimes a violent history, um, the ownership history, art, you know, the archaeological story, um, the art historical story, the aesthetic story, but, um, and, you know, I think that's what university art museums are trying to do, is find a way to use their, themselves as platforms to bring in the great minds um, and the sort of pedagogical opportunities uh, that exist on campus. Thomas, for you, um, what, what's involved in your approach? Well, I mean, first of all, I think in order to be a great writer, you have to uh, read a lot. I think you need to uh, read great plays if you're going to write a great play, but you also just need to see lots of different examples of, of plays and screenplays and films. And uh, I think I've learned the most from from work that I didn't like, you know? Um, What's an example of that? <laughs> I would say, <laughs> I'll, I'll simply say that uh, 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 my whole aesthetic is pretty much based on the fact that uh, my, my wife used to be the managing editor at Samuel French Play Publisher, so I, I pretty much saw every play in New York City every year, and I, we would see five to seven plays a year, and 90% of the time, I was bored to death. 
and um, I would often walk out of plays, and I didn't um, agree with what the theater community in general was doing, what they, what, what, what was being valued aesthetically. So uh, I'm seeking to change that through my plays. Um, I try to teach my students that art is everywhere. Uh, my beginning writing students, I have them go to Norris. I say, I say, sit next to some people and eavesdrop in their conversation. <laughs> and then write a play based on that. I tell them, I, t I, t I, t I tell them to read the newspaper, um, uh, find an article that they're interested in, and, 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 and write a play based on that. Um, and today, since TV is so important in people's lives, the role of the film, all of my students are natural storytellers in a way that maybe wouldn't have been true 60 years ago. Um, so uh, I tell them to trust their instincts. Don't get bogged down in, in doing it the correct way. We can, we can figure out problems of, of structure and craft later on, but um, telling a good story is a really hard thing to do under any circumstances. So uh, I encourage them to do that. And uh, for me personally, the uh, Wuthering, reading the novel Wuthering Heights was the thing that made me want to become a writer. I read this novel, this thing that, you know, written in 1836 or whatever, I expect it to be the most boring thing in the world. And Emily Bronte made me think, I was like, if this is what writing can do, then I want to be a writer. Right? So um, I, I try to ignite that in my students in some way. Can you just give a brief, like, what, what was it that that novel was doing that, that yes, that's what I want to do? Well, <laughs> uh, I guess it captured the breadth and depth of human emotion in a way that was almost illogical, but yet completely logical to me. Um, I, I deeply relate to the character of Heathcliff. I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> but, 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 but just his concept of love. So, you know, when um, Catherine dies, you know, Heathcliff digs up her dead body and is just, you know, holding her bones in, in the rain and, 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 uh, you know, her, 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 her decomposing body in the rain at that point. And his most fervent wish after, uh, so for when he dies, is that they have two coffins next to each other and they knock out the sides so that their bones can, can intermingle and blend with each other. And uh, that's true love. <laughs> And, 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 and that was something that I, I'd never seen before. I, I, often in art, we, 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 we set up strict parameters for human emotion and human behavior, and Emily Bronte just broke, broke out of all of that, which is why Charlotte Bronte went around town apologizing for her everywhere she went. And she was like, you know, Emily, Emily just like, doesn't understand what proper manners are, and she doesn't understand um, what audience, audiences actually want to see and read, but um, it's a masterpiece. Right, right, exactly. So um, for you, Stuart, how, how do you talk about the value of art, whether to teachers or audiences or to yourself as you're setting out to write again? We were talking about um, the um, desire to integrate the arts at the university, and I think that in one of the ways that comes out is that each human being makes that integration as well. And so the institution and the journey that each human being makes, we think of universities primarily um, improperly so, I think, it, it, as places where there's Aristotelian learning, that as things are divided into categories and studied, and there's um, syllogistic thinking were um, logic and so on and so the only test is can you be funny can you play a great solo can you write a hell of a story so there's 
a kind of a, uh, rather than uh, learning through study, it's learning through doing, through making. Um, and um, I'm, I forget the question. <laughs> <laughs> Martha, <laughs> Martha um, just a closing thought about the value of the arts. As you've said, the value of arts, I, you know, I think what I want students to know, and I think art is a great way to teach it, is um, how important the skill set of creativity and intuition is, regardless of what you're studying and what your ultimate career goal will be. I think it's tragic when you hear a student say, you know, I'm going into math because I'm not creative. I mean, you know. At certain levels of mathematics, there's no discipline more creative in some ways. And I think, um, you know, I think the importance of intuition and the understanding that there are lessons that, let's say, art making can teach you. One of the big lessons is about tenaciousness. It's about the iterative process that making art, whether it's a performance or or a work of art, a physical work of art. Artists iterate, they keep trying and they keep trying and they try different things and they experiment and they eventually you know, reach a goal. And that sense of intellectual tenaciousness and seeing creativity is actually part of um, a really important um, intellectual process. I think it's something every student needs to know. And Victor, you'll have the last word because you're about to actually demonstrate the value of arts in your performance with Julius. I think the value of art is that it makes us all better people. For me, the complexity of things should always come out of the simplicity of it. We live in a world where we go from simplicity from complexity, but I think if we just did with something simple like the blues, you spoke about Bob Dylan, or you know Eric Clapton, or Miles Davis, or any of them, just the blues has been a central force inside of jazz that has been, and will always be, an emotional type of thing that will move people. I'm, in, in recent times, obviously in universities, we have to have scales of um, critiquing people called grades. But I'll, I'll often in my travels say that everybody should get a musical instrument and play. I did a show once at Jazz and Lincoln Center called Jazz and Art, where a colleague of mine, Ted Nash, collaborated with Museum of Modern Art in New York, and he took the work of six artists. And I cannot name them all for you, but I do remember one of them specifically. Jackson Pollock. And I hadn't really checked out Jackson Pollock's work, but when I saw it, our photographer was an art history major. So when I looked at Jackson Pollock's work, I was like, where's the art? I don't see it. He said, but you don't see the organization up there? I said, no, I don't see it. And he went through describing everything to me. I was like, I don't see it. But obviously, a group of people came together and qualified his work as being masterpieces. But what it made me say is that, well, if he can pay, I can pay. <laughs> so I went and bought some canvas. I went and bought some acrylic paints. I decided acrylic was going to be my medium. And I started reading and doing what I was doing. I, I painted a couple of pieces. I wouldn't show them to anyone. <laughs> but I think it made me a better person along the way. And I think for all of those who have performed or played an instrument or danced or something along the way and done something creative in the arts, they always say, man, I wish I was still playing it, but I'm glad I did do it at that time. And for those of you who have not yet done it, I always say there's two types of jazz musicians. Those who are playing and those who are going to play. <laughs> so if you haven't done it yet, pick up your instrument or your paintbrush or your pencil or curate and become one of those people who are contributing to the arts in any and every way possible. So as I said, Victor Goins and the very talented Julius Tucker are going to come to the stage and close today's program with a performance. Um, and then you may have heard a cello or two uh, tuning up in the background. There is a cello happening happening uh, at, at two, I believe, at Lewis. So um, just head back outdoors after this and follow the cellos to this happening. So. Uh, a final thank you to all of our panelists, Martha Tedeschi, Victor Goyen, Stuart Divick, and Thomas Bradshaw. It was great to have you.